Each of these people up here has a Twitter, so make sure that you go and follow them. But Mike, I was stalking yours and saw that you had an original drawing of Hellboy on there. So whenever you're doing some, oh, maybe not. No, I don't know. I know nothing about my Twitter. I, <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 I'm computer illiterate. My wife handles Twitter. So. Well, you. <laughs> well, you don't have, have Bless to. Bless her heart. Can she do mine? Because yeah, like, well, that's why. You don't have to know about your Twitter to answer this question. Um, but whenever you're coming up with a character, do you draw it out first and then think what goes into this character, or do you have it fully visualized and that informs what it looks like? Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, there's no easy one way of doing things. Uh, sometimes I have a name uh, for a character, but I don't know who the character is. Uh, I wish that happened more often because names are the hardest thing for me. Um, sometimes, because I'm, I, I still think I'm an artist first, I'm usually starting with some kind of image. And then, and some of these characters, you know, I throw them in. They're, they may be a background character or the supporting character. Um, and sometimes they make their one appearance and they leave. And sometimes they go, oh, don't forget about me. I've got 10,000 things over here, which is why this one little comic book series has snowballed into the, you know, Hellboy universe. Not because my publisher didn't even want to expand it that much, mm -hmm. but it was just me going back and going, I've got more stories about all these guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, oh, all right, we'll publish more books that sell, so okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why they're so against yeah. publishing books that sell, but you know, <laughs> yeah. So when you each had a completed manuscript and you were looking at it or completed panels, um, were you visualizing then? Did you think this would be good on screen? Or was there anything about your books? I mean, you have so much real history in with, in with your stories. And you have a lot of emails and journals and things that go along with yours. Were there parts that you thought this would be really tricky to adapt? Or were you thinking this, this could be a good visual um, entertainment? Well, for a long time. Uh ever since the books were published, people have been wanting to make movies out of them. But back in the day, it was, you know, a two-hour movie or nothing. You know, you didn't have a, a license to take a huge book or a huge series of books and do television for, you know, months or years or whatever. So it was going to be a two-hour movie. And I'd look at Outlander and I'd think, no way. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. It didn't stop people from trying. You know, we got two or three requests a month for options. But um, I talked to my agents and learned fairly early on. When you get approached to, for an option, probably most of you know what that is, but just in case, uh, if someone wants to make film of your book, they approach you or your agent, and they offer you a modest amount of money for a period of time. That's all it is, is a period Very of time. Very modest. Right. <laughs> it ranges. Astonishingly modest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I've gotten from 5000 to 50000 and we, uh, we've optioned the books uh, only three times before this last time, which was nuts. Um, I'll get into that later if we have time. But anyway, during that period, of time, this person, this production company, this producer, has the sole and exclusive right to try to put together all of the stuff that you need to put together to make film happen. You know, to attach a director, find a writer, get a script produced, and most importantly, raise the money. You know, making a two-hour movie would cost at a minimum about $60 million, so this is not a light thing. Consequently, when you deal with uh, would-be optioneers, you want someone who's done it before. You want to know, have you ever made a movie? Have you ever made TV? Uh, the answer to that is usually no, which knocks off 99.5% of the people who've been asking. Uh, the next question you want to know is, uh, if you have made a movie, was it any good? <laughs> and <laughs> do they have it to show you, or was it only released in you know, Latvia? And uh, nothing against Latvia. I'm sure they have lots of good movies. But um, anyway, uh, if those answers are both <laughs> possible, you're down to about 0.2% you know, of the remainder. And then you want to know, have you actually read my book? because a lot of people have not. Astonishingly, the answer to that is no so often. Yes, we have it People is. are actually mm -hmm. opening their wallets and they haven't read it. They haven't, yeah. no. They want Some, to... Sometimes they'll try to fake it that yeah. they've yeah. read it, and that's, that's really <laughs> uncomfortable. Oh, yes. as, you know, I've, been a, I've been a teacher of one kind or another since 1984, and my bullshit detector is flawless, and watching somebody <laughs> pretend to have read something, right, as an, as an English teacher, it's like, just stop, just stop, right? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no, that's true. But then the final question is, did you understand the book? You know, do you actually get what this book is about? I had one uh, nice producer flew over from Hollywood to have lunch with me in Scottsdale. We were getting along perfectly along this. She wanted to make a four-hour miniseries for ABC. And, uh, you know, did really well till the dessert course when she said, uh, well, you know, ABC has their stable of actors and actresses that they like to use, uh, most of whom are Americans. She said, of course, Jamie has to be Scottish because of the kilt and the accent, but I don't see why we can't make Claire be an American. And I said, in that case, you don't see why I won't give you an option. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, vanishingly small. That's why we've only optioned the books three times until this latest one. And this latest one was a guy named Jim Kohlberg, who was an investment banker and hit his 50s and decided he wanted to make something besides money. He wanted to make movies and he thought he'd start with Outlander because he'd fallen in love with the book. He had actually read it four times before he came to talk to us. And in the midst of the negotiations, he called up one day to tell me he thought he was channeling Myrtle. <laughs> I said, okay. Yeah, so we went with uh, Jim. Well, meanwhile, unbeknownst to me, Ron Moore had finished making Battlestar Galactica and was looking for another passion project, as he put it. And his uh, business partner, Merrill, and his wife partner, uh, Terry, uh, were both huge Outlander fans. And essentially, they said, have you ever thought of Outlander? And he said, no, what's Outlander? And he said, to which my wife said, well, this is a book that's been lying around our house for 20 years. You, know? <laughs> you keep tripping over. So he read it. And and uh, it was very flattering. He said he stayed up all night reading it. And he said, uh, this is one of the better compliments I've got. He said, you know, stories have patterns. You hit a certain point in a story and you think, oh, it's going to unroll this way. You know, now they're here and, and this is going to happen. And he said, you didn't do that. Every time I hit one of those points, you went in the other direction. <laughs> you know, I never knew where the story was going. And I said, you never will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so far, that's held. <laughs> what was the question? So, <laughs> um, so basically, I was just asking if you had already envisioned it as being oh, on yeah. the screen, but yeah. this also brought up a good point. My next question was going to be, was there anything that you felt like you had to have to say yes once you had, I mean, you had a hit on your hands already, for somebody to come and approach you, what was going to take the yes? Well, my circumstance was very, very peculiar because I went from zero to 60 in about two seconds flat. <laughs> I was working on this book. Um, that I described, you know, I was, started writing it with my daughter because I had another book that was not going well. And when I say not going well, I mean it was on oxygen, it was circling the drain. And, but I had also spent the advance on it. And I had not spent it at the track. I had not bought drugs and dark alleyways. I'd spent it on things like diapers and daycare and the mortgage because it's sort of root, you know, the writer's life, the routine infusions of cash that I got for my rather modest literary projects um, would sort of, you know, keep, keep the ship above water. And my wife had just had another baby and wanted to leave the workforce for a period of time and we'd re relocated to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I start writing this other thing, right? And um, the meter's running on my turning in this other manuscript to my other editor, okay? Um, so it's a big risk. And um, I finally, you know, went, went to my wife and I said, like, well, you know, what are we going to do? I, I showed it to, to be honest, I, I showed it to my editor, the one who had purchased, the, you know, the, the book I was supposed to be working on. I finally had to be honest. I'm like, listen, I sort of am working on this other thing. And she didn't like it at all. She was like, don't do this. This is not you. Because publishing has a strong sense of, you know, once you've written a couple of books, that's the, that's the slot you're in. That's the lane you're going to bowl in forever. Right? And I would rather be locked in the trunk of a car in the hot sun with a weasel than always write the same book. <laughs> right? So this was a little troubling to me. And so she, but she just like, rejected it outright. I don't even, you know, good luck to you. And, and yet I owed the money. So I went to my wife and I said, I really want to keep writing this. I, you know, I don't know what this means. Like, I, I, I can't, like, I, I, have to, I cannot justify this. And she said to me, all right, um, I have one question, which is that um, we all know an advance is, an, is not a debt, but it is if you don't turn in the book, right? And um, she said, can they get the house? Can your publisher get the house? Right? And I said, that's a good question. And so I called the person who does my taxes, and I said, can I get the house? And as it turns out, no, because in Texas, where I live, there are things called homestead laws, which are specifically designed to keep men from gambling the family home away at the poker table. Saved by the poker Okay, table. right. So they could go after me forever, but they could not take away the, the house in which my babies were sleeping. Okay? And so I said, okay, let's go. 
right? And I, I didn't have very much time because the, 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 meter was, the money meter was, you know, the tanks were emptying very fast. And I managed to get to about page 400 of the book, which is a sort of natural resting place. And I'd show this to my agent. She really loved it. But I still had no idea if anybody in the universe would want this. Like, I really did not know because, uh, among other things, there's a tendency for publishing to look at you after you've written a couple books as a certain kind of writer and no other. Um, so um, the night before, you know, uh, she sent it out. I was wholly prepared to be told this whole thing was a gigantic mistake, right? And start calling about home equity loans to pay off my advance, and which would not have worked because we had very little equity. But it was the only thing I could think to do. And um, and then within a period, again, this was this was 400 pages of the passage. It was roughly the first third of the manuscript. It was ended up being about a 1,250-page manuscript. Um, within a period of, of, of you know, of just like a few weeks, um, the entire, like, my, my life had been entirely rewritten. I mean, it was, the, the, the world went berserk for it, and I got paid, you know, plenty of money, and it sold in 50 countries, and Hollywood showed up, like, while the ink was still wet. And um, a whole bunch of studios got involved in competing to have it. And I was, you know, I was a babe in the woods with this stuff. I had, you know, I, 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 just, I was just trying to make sure that I, I could afford to put braces on my kids. Like, it was, it was very, very weird. I remember taking a phone call from an agent. Like, we were, there was a bidding war between Ridley Scott and Ron Howard. And I'm actually, like, on a freeway trying to get my kid to a swimming lesson. Okay? <laughs> right? It was Priorities. that weird. Right? <laughs> And nobody can understand, like, why are you, just, what, just sit down, like, go, we have to do this, this is really important. I'm like, no, my, my kids are learning to swim, okay? <laughs> like, they're swimming. And it, was, it was so weird. And so at the, at the end, Fox bought it for um, Ridley Scott as a feature, right? Which I knew they didn't have a chance of. I don't say I knew, I sort of believed, you know, but it was Ridley Scott, right? You know, you know Gladiator, Alien, Blade Runner, right? Like, these really touchstone pictures for me. So I was perfectly happy with it. Um, and, um, but of course, they struggled. They struggled to make it into a film. It's going to be a television show. It's starting in January. It took a long time to get to that. But between 2007, when the deal was originally done, and now, television really opened up. That's, that, that it became the, the, the giant sucking sound for, you know, for, for, for story of any kind. It's gone to television. And so it gradually is... As, as you know, as the movie sort of struggled to get traction, and then television came, became better and better. That's what I was rooting for. It took a long time to actually make it happen, but um, that, that's how I ended up there. You know, I mean, mine's radically, radically different. Um, you know, in comics now, if you create something that you own, generally the publisher is going to you know attach. The film rights, because most comics don't make any money, especially if they're not mainstream comics things. So the only, you know, a lot of publishers are just saying, "Well, we'll publish it because it might be a movie or a TV." Um, I got in right before that, so I still had, you know, the film rights. So my publisher came to me because they also produce films. They came to me to option it, and this was a, maybe a year or two into doing the comic, and I thought, "Well, that's safe, free money." It wasn't very much money, but there was no way in hell anybody was ever going to make a movie about a red character with horn stumps and a tail. <laughs> so I just thought, man, if I can just squeak out some free money, maybe a couple years they'll option it uh, before they realize it's impossible to make it. <laughs> and, and nobody wanted to make it. Nobody wanted to make it except this crazy guy from Mexico, Guillermo del Toro, <laughs> who fortunately is very charming and very convincing, and uh, we both had the least commercial actor in mind to play the lead, <laughs> who, uh, who'd never been the star of a film before. Um, people only remembered him from an old Beauty and the Beast TV series he did. Um, and it took six years, but he fought like a dog, and the whole time I just said, it'll never happen, don't get your hopes up, don't get excited, um, you know, and, and uh, he did it. And it seems like Guillermo was such a perfect partnership for yours because he's often talked about having monsters that aren't conventionally monsters, you know, not the Nosferatu, they're layered as Hellboy is, he's not what people are expecting him to be. Um, 
Yeah, I, I was very lucky, and in, in he uh, and he changed the the work quite a bit. Um, but I think he saw it as a vehicle for a lot of other stuff he wanted to do. In fact, there are certain scenes in the in the probably in both Hellboy movies that were from other scripts he had written. Uh, so I was kind of just the excuse for him to do a lot of other stuff. Um, but but I also I think comics, adapting comics has got to be so much trickier than what you guys have gone through because you guys have written a book. So you go, oh, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end of a book. If you have 25 years of a comic, people go, we want to do this story, but we want to take this from this and this from this and this. And suddenly you're like, uh, how do I cram all these different pieces into what was a solid story? It's so like the new one, this, the, the reboot that we've got going on right now, they took one of my, they took the middle of a three book arc the middle of that story, and they said, we're going to make a movie out of that. <laughs> it's like, well, so we're going to take out the setup, and we're going to take out the ending, and we're just going to do the middle book, but you also want to sprinkle bits from all my other books into that? I was horrified. Um, I said, I want nothing at all to do with this. They said, well, they weren't going to make it anyway, and then you go, oh, what if they do? I mean, they almost certainly won't be able to do it, but what if they do? and they're asking me to help them, I can't not help. And it was, it's been a very long process. Um, but once I wrapped my brain around what they were trying to do, I was able to say, okay, if you're gonna do that, and if you're bound to determine to use those things, let me go in there and show you how it works. Because clearly, and nothing against the original writer, but he's just not as familiar with what the thinking process was. Mm -hmm. So he, he knew the events that were in the book, but didn't quite get why those events are important and what, why they have to happen in a certain order. So uh, that's been the last couple of years of my life. The whole time saying, well, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> but heaven forbid it does happen, I guess I have to read the script one more time. So we haven't seen Neil's um, version of Hellboy yet, and the passage hasn't premiered yet. Um, but from what we have seen, or from what maybe you guys have seen without us, um, did the characters, I mean, I heard a fan earlier talking and saying, Diana's work is so um, descriptive that fans don't argue about what it's going to look like because we already know. <laughs> so ha did each of your projects look the way that you thought that they were going to look when you were writing it, or did it drastically change, either from characters or tone or the setting? I mean, I think I've got the easiest thing, because I draw pictures yeah. of this stuff. So you at least have they have something visual. to refer to. And they to. can't really deviate too much from it. It would seem oh, very peculiar. they can. In terms of, a, no, but I just, <laughs> no, but I mean, in terms of, like, just physical appearance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, just like, the, 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 at least with the signature character. Right, yeah. yeah. There's, there's yeah. a certain template, but. Uh, well, I yeah. saw the poster yesterday, I believe, it has the full horns on the, on the new one. Well, we were also in a weird f spot because we did have Ron Perlman for two pictures looking fantastic. Mm -hmm. So everybody's like, oh no, the new guy just looks like Ron. And you go, no, it looks like a red, no. it looks like my character. Mm -hmm. So we, we've yeah. already established what the character looks like. We can't change it just to be changing it. Though I did, I did go in and make some, some changes, like his hand is a little bit different. Now people are like, oh, they got the hand wrong. I'm like, no, no, that, that was me. Oh, good. Just so. <laughs> We it know would it's, be a it's little kosher. different than the first one. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine what it's like when you've written a book and I don't know how much you visualize yeah. your, your characters and then you go, oh, what about this actor? And you're like, holy shit, never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, the passage, the, the television show, and I have, seen, I have seen the pilot and I've read a bunch of scripts and they're shooting episode four, and I think two is in post now. I mean, it's really kind of happening even as we speak. While I sit in my office in Massachusetts um, or Texas writing a totally different book, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a different headspace now, which is, which is very nice, actually. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, it's quite different. I mean, it's had to diverge for a million reasons. And the toolbox that I have as a writer of narrative you know, it's so different from what they have for any visual medium. I mean, I have, I have access to what characters are thinking. Like, I can just tell you, I can narrate a story, right? <laughs> it's a, you know, it's, and now I think, what a luxury, you know? Like, um, and I'm all, I also believe rather, rather sincerely uh, that, that every time a book is read, it's different. 
You know, it's, I do half the work. I give the, enough material, and it can be very, very specific material, but nevertheless, it's the half of it. I give the reader, I give the reader half the material, enough material for them to construct a persuasive, temporary reality of fact and feeling in their head. So the swimming pool I put in a novel, it's not the swimming pool they put in the novel, but it's a swimming pool, okay? And I use the swimming pool example because I learned this actually from a short story that involved a swimming pool once, and I realized that when I read this, it was a short story by John Updike, very literary, you know, little artifact, but it begins that scene in the swimming pool, magnificently described, but I realized that the pool that I saw was not the one he had put in there, it was a pool that I swam in as a kid, and that's what he wanted. Right, because it's very specifically a community swimming pool. So I constructed this community pool, uh, Katona, New York, circa 1974. And I feel like we're getting one of your classes for free. I know, like I am a, such a nerd for this stuff. So, but that means that every time a book is re- a book is not a thing, it's actually a s- series of occurrences. It's an event that happens every time the book is read, and every time the book is read, which in- incidentally means a book can theoretically have an infinite existence, right? It, it's, it's kind of cool. Like it, if it's read an infinite number of times, there's an infinite number. Of, of events that the book is. And every time it's completely different, not just in terms of emphasis, but in terms of um, you know, what people think people look like. I, if you spend a lot of time describing a character, you are wasting your ink, right? The reader gets to do a lot of that work, okay? And, um, and you, know, you give them enough. I was, it's the rule of clothing, shoes, and hair. Like, give me three things and the reader will do the rest of it because they have to. If you don't give the reader a job, they get pissed off, <laughs> right? They feel shoved around. They feel bullied. <laughs> and so the, the television show, which is an adaptation, and takes tremendous liberties and tremendous license and, 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 and has to, among other things, you know, the executives from the studio will be like, well, we need, this, we need more women. Right, so they'll change a character that I had as a man and make it a woman. I'm fine with that. Like, I really that that stuff doesn't bother me. It's like more women on TV. Right on, go for it. There's no reason this character has to be male. You have to construct a slightly different backstory. You got to twist the the knobs to make the gender work. But it, that's like fine. I could have done it too. It just didn't occur to me. Mm-hmm. Right, that's fine. Good for you. Right. <laughs> um, a bunch of people got their their undies in a bunch because the main character Amy. Uh, they cast an African-American actress for the role. And she is, in fact, described as sort of like profoundly pale and dark-haired, right? That was an arbitrary pick, on my point. She could have been an African-American child. And the reason that we cast, I didn't, they did, this African-American actress, Sanaya Sidney, is that she totally crushed the audition, right? Such a good actor. She's so good, adorable, lovely kid too. I really enjoy spending time with her. But like, that's the reality of making a TV show. Who's gonna carry this ball? And as it turns out, it happened to be a young African American woman from Riverside, California, who was in Fences and Hidden Figures, and happened to be available for this when she wasn't hanging around with Denzel Washington. I'm like, sign that girl up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's dead right. Um, I mean, I personally, for me, a character is their dialogue. You know, that's what creates them on the page. And you know, the rest is, as you say, pretty much window dressing. On the other hand, people actually pay attention to the window dressing on occasion. Do fans, fans yeah, get fans, fans get very yeah. yeah they can be upset yeah, about this. So yeah. you know, it, it doesn't matter so much now that we're getting into much more minor characters. But it used to be every time they cast someone for something in you know, a huge uproar. Oh, you know, he's too short. He's too tall. He's, you know, she's too tall. Yeah. Oh my God, her eyes aren't blue. <laughs> I don't even know what color my own eyes are you know it's yeah. I have to check my driver's license I, I spend so much time explaining to the fans it's a different thing yeah. it's it's a variation on my thing it doesn't make my thing go away and to me my you know the, the comic will always be the real version but you know it's you, you gotta let go of some of those details or just don't see the movie um, <laughs> Because, yeah, and, and you guys must get this question. I get it all the time. How much control did you have on the film? <laughs> and that's exactly my answer, yeah. is it wasn't my money. Yeah. So there's yeah. a very, I'm very happy that they ask. Yeah. And I think we do, we don't have control, but I think these days the with the internet, we right. cer- they certainly want us to yes. be happy. Yeah. 
They want you to be happy. I'd say yes. that's, that's well, right. Well, they want you to be happy. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, we are. telling you not to be happy. <laughs> yeah. right. And I think Anne Rice did that with Interview with the Vampire. When she came out and said, they're ruining my books, they, they kind of went, we don't want that to happen anymore. We have enough trouble selling a movie. We don't need the creator out there right. against us. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That, I, I get, we we get handled a little bit as if we're like a, yeah. a a grenade that maybe the pen is not in it still. Yeah. You know, right? Well, you know, yeah. it, it, it actually helps yeah. if you, yeah. you know, sort of let it out a little bit once in a while. You yeah. know, just to show. Yeah. But uh, no, I I am not, I do not have control. I can't make them do or not do anything. However, I do have two million of you guys, and uh, if I tell you what they're doing and that I don't like it, they will in fact listen. And I don't do that because it's, it makes for bad relations. But uh, I get along really well with the, with the show people. And, uh, and they are, in fact, very courteous to me. And I, I'm a consultant, which I asked my agent when we got the, the contract. I said, it says I'm a consultant. What does that mean? <laughs> do I have to go to Hollywood? And he said, no. He said, it can mean anything. It most likely means that they'll pay you 10 grand per episode for doing nothing. Right. And um, I, I said, like okay, that. I can live with that. Yeah, all right, fine. I, yeah. <laughs> I, we were looking for a title. For, for me on the on the Hellboy films when we came up with visual consultant mm-hmm. and it doesn't obligate me to do anything because right. I said I don't really want to be a writer I don't really want to be this 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 or this yeah. uh, but if you want to ask me questions yeah. uh, seems like you know, I'll, you I'll take your call yeah. Yeah. For that. Yeah. Uh, I'll make sure to supply you with my phone number uh, yes. <laughs> but I'm very careful to get a title that, that doesn't obligate me yeah. to actually do anything yeah exactly and yet you know they show me everything they show me the script outlines and they show me the scripts and the 16 different revisions to each script. They show me the daily footage that they shoot, which is a lot of the fun. The dailies? Yes, I do, wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, there's this company called Easton that does these fancy leather-bound editions of my books, and they have them all personally signed by me, which they actually are. But they send me these piles of what are called tip sheets, which are just the disconnected front sheets, and I sign them all and mail them back, and they bind them into the books. So that's what I do in the evenings is watch dailies when I'm signing my name. <laughs> no, so <laughs> sometimes... Is, is they always look like a bad high school oh, play. Yeah. They're just like, you cannot you cannot look at those things and think that in any way this yeah. could ever be watchable without <laughs> any of the production on it. Oh, so terrible. It's, it's don't panic. Yeah. Once the music and we, t- and we yeah. do the voices and stuff, and you're yeah, like, yeah, I'd rather not lot. see yeah. it. Yeah. No, it's agony. Yeah. Absolute agony. Yeah, though, on the other hand, I mostly watch the dailies for, you know, the ones that don't work. You know? Right. <laughs> yeah, there was the one, I think it was the famous honeypot scene where James me and Claire are in bed, and you know she has just had a wax job, which she doesn't know about, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, they they, uh, they begin the scene and so forth, and and Jamie says, "Oh my God, what have you done?" And, and Claire has a reply, but Katrina forgot it, so she was started several times, and she said, "I forgot. What have I done?" And he looked at her, said, "Very matter of fact, you shaved your panani." <laughs> and, <laughs> Did you spend a lot of time on set? Um, mostly I only go, you know, if they're having a press junket or something. First uh, ep- uh, first season, they asked me to do a, a cameo, which I did, which was a lot of fun. Oh, that's cool. That was entertaining. Uh, oh, right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Now, the second season, I actually wrote an episode for them, which was also fun, as I got to go be on set for a month while they filmed it. And, you know, Sam Hewen said to me, you know, filmmaking is intense and, re- intense and relentless, and he's totally right. You work 12, 14 hours a day, every day. You know, you might get one or possibly two days on the weekend. That's all anyone talks about on set is, what are you going to do on the weekend, you know? Yeah. 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 It's so much like real work. Yeah. yeah it's disturbing. It's a yeah. lot of work, Yeah. yeah. We are usually doing it outside in the rain and the mud yeah. and you know, the Scottish weather. <laughs> but also, it's 90% waiting. You yeah, know? It's, yeah. It's no, just, you're just standing there. Especially <laughs> when you're doing some of the heavy visual effects stuff mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. and you've spent four hours setting up a trap door which doesn't work. Yeah. And then everybody has to, like, well, break for lunch no yeah. matter what time it is, and we'll come back in eight hours yeah. when we have the trap door working. Yeah. It's, writing a book is so luxurious. Compared to make me no, honestly, I, I, it makes you really appreciate the fact that it's just you and your old flannel bathrobe. I speak for myself, and um, <laughs> a cup of coffee and a little bit of quiet, and you know, and then you break and have your tuna sandwich. <laughs> it's like, no, it's no, it's really true. It, it, it made me appreciate. I mean, I did three months on on both of the first two pictures. On both pictures, I I worked in pre-production on the films doing design and stuff for three solid months. And so little, especially on the second film, so little of what I did 
uh, made it into the film. And I thought, man, that's three months of my life that I could have been in my studio producing something. Because when I work for myself, anything I do is going to be published. But to work on that stuff, it's a nice paycheck, but you have no idea if it's, there's so much stuff that goes into making a film. And, yeah. you know, also it's very weird to work on a picture where you go, well, let's do this. And people go, no, we're going to do this other thing. And you're like, you know, I used to be in charge of this right. character. <laughs> That's a weird thing you have to adjust to. Well, that happens, you know, regardless. Uh, but as I say, luckily, they do encourage me to make comments on anything that I see, and I do, you know. And usually, my comment is, yeah, this is great, I love it, you know, or I can, occasionally I will say, why can't any of your actors tell the difference between lie and lay? <laughs> <You know? That's> right, <laughs> yeah. Because they're under 50 is why. But, uh, but, you know, things like that. And But every once in a while, there will be something that's, you know, a major bone of contention. And, you know, we just argue it uh, civilly to a point. I remember one one script, and it's only been one, or I wrote back and I said, I don't use language bad enough to tell you how much I hate this. Ah. <laughs> and they changed I've got, it. I've got notes that are a lot blunter than that. Uh, they come with a scrippled, crumpled uh, script page. Uh, but I've been, on this one, I've been asked a lot, as we're in post-production, to rewrite dialogue. So, and it's, it's scary, because I always think, well, there's a professional film writer somewhere involved. Uh, so I will write dialogue and say something like this, and they'll go, this is great, we're recording it in 20 minutes. Yeah. I'm thinking, is there somebody else who can do another pass on that? Yeah. Hey, uh, these are your characters, you know how they sound. <laughs> but I find it really uncomfortable, and it's just me, I guess, when I actually hear my actual dialogue, it's, I'm, I guess I'm so conditioned to somebody else rewriting my stuff, which gives me a little bit more distance. But if it's mine, I just go, oh no, I'm embarrassed because I'm sure there was a better way to do that. Um, but apparently, having seen other people write this stuff, my way is at least as good, yeah. <laughs> good as theirs. So I've started calling it professional fan fiction. I used it to apply whenever I was doing my review of Halloween earlier this year um, because Danny McBride had written it um, based on the originals. But it kind of applies to you guys too, where you have professional writers, but it's fan fiction because they loved your your stories before they were writing it. Um, but back whenever you're in your bathrobe by yourself and writing <laughs> writing your page, we kind of imagine you guys as being omnipotent and knowing exactly where it's going to go, and you've got a plan. Are there ever characters? that emerge that you weren't expecting or that become a favorite of yours that you thought was going to be a throwaway? Yeah, all the time. Uh, I'm, well, for one thing, I never plan books ahead of, of, um, of, of time, and I don't write in a straight line either. I write in little bits and pieces where I can see things happen, and then gradually they stick together. It's like playing Tetris in my head, but very slowly. <laughs> and uh, along the way, characters just do pop up. Well, for me, characters are one of three kinds. They're either onions, hard nuts, or mushrooms which sounds like turkey dressing, but, yeah. um, but you know, an onion is somebody whose internal essence I understand immediately. I know who this person is and their soul. But the longer I work with them, the more rounded and pungent they get with layers of experience. Jamie and Claire are both onions. Um, hard nuts are the people that I'm stuck with. Uh, they don't come out of my mind. They're historical people that I have to deal with. You know, obviously we have to see George Washington at least once. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and they're people that I'm stuck with by reason of the plot. For instance, Brianna Fraser exists only because her mother was pregnant at the end of the previous book. And she's 18 now, so here's this person I know nothing about her. You know, so I'm thinking, who the heck are you? And, uh, but I, I have to have her, of course. And the third are the mushrooms. These are the people who pop up out of nowhere and just walk off with any scene they're in. Mr. Willoughby from Voyager was a mushroom. Lord John Gray is uh, probably my best mushroom. You know, he, he, he just <laughs> walks into any situation. <laughs> Oh, me? It, it happens all the time. I mean, I don't have any sort of culinary scheme to describe it, but... Um, well, my, my feeling about this is I, well, I have a, I'll have a space in a book for a kind of thing or a kind of person. And I actually do plan, right? But I know that I'm going to need to work on the details of incitement that make a novel, make a plot actually work. And then there's a lot of, you know, what Virginia... Virginia Woolf said you can waste a whole day trying to get your characters from the living room to the patio, and it's absolutely true. There's a lot of just, you know, mechanical stuff, 
in a book, and often you, you need a character to perform the mechanical stuff. And, and so you, you have a sense in the back of your mind, and I think it's, it's not the back of your mind, it's the, the basement of your mind, it's the unconscious, which is working very busily. All this stuff, any good work, any good art comes from the unconscious most of the time. That's where the real genius resides, which can make these unusual connections and plan extravagantly and draw these, you know, these long lines between things in the way that, you know, I think of Dickens as, as sort of the paradigm of novelists where one thread is actually connected by other threads to everything else, that kind of stuff. You can't do that consciously. I mean, maybe there's somebody who can, but for the unconscious mind, it's like a day at the office. That's all it does. That's its one job. And so when a character mushrooms, my thinking is like, yeah, it mushroomed, but it was there. Like, I, I, I put it there. Like, it was, and, and, and now it's, it's turned to like, now I have to pay attention to it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I had, a, in, the, in the past the trilogy, for instance, a character who I never, pla never planned on particularly se stepped into, late into the first book and becomes a very important character through two other books. And it's a guy named Lucius Greer, who's a soldier, but he becomes a mystic. And what had happened was I just passed the baton between one character who had moved on, was performing the mystic role, and still needed a mystic in the book, right? So he comes in and like, you know, you meet him and he's just this sort of rough guy, and then later on he ends up having a conversation with somebody and you realize like that his concerns are completely celestial. Like there's, there's something eating him and eating at him and he can't figure it out. It's been bothering him since he was a kid. By the end of the book, he's, he's, like, he's a monk, practically. Like he goes and he has his trial in the wilderness and all this stuff and lives a completely hermetic existence and then eventually gives himself to a project based entirely upon faith. Right? He was there because it was already, the track was already running. It started in chapter two, like literally eight years earlier when I created this other character to do that job. And these religious questions sort of started coming into the book somewhat earlier than I had anticipated, but nevertheless, in a way that I felt was honest and made sense. So I needed another ball carrier, right? I needed somebody else to carry that, that ball. And, and he, he just said, yeah, right here, thanks. Sometimes a mushroom turns into a tree. A, yeah, it's just, yeah, I, I found doing this stuff, even, the, I mean, at the beginning I had no idea who anybody was, and I would write these kind of vague prophecies, which I'd always have to keep track of, but I, I was so afraid of writing myself into a corner. So I tried to keep stuff loose so I could reinterpret, you know, because if I, if I bound the characters too tightly to something, I found that they died. It was like, you know, it, it, it's, I can't restrict their m movements that much. I eventually had a general idea where I was going, but I was going to take my time getting there. And everyone's all characters. As an artist, I know how drawing works. You know, it's sweating and swearing and erasing, but writing when it's working is really weird to me because you just go, oh, you want to do that? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll let you do that. Don't go too far that way, but... But, you know, I'll, I'll let you go. Um, but I also, I mean, mechanically, I, I did learn that if I'm doing a comic, I should at least write some notes for myself before I start. Because there's a sequence in the second Hellboy book where I have him interacting with the goddess Hecate. And it's just a fight. You know, it was not supposed to be anything more than a big comic book fight. But... When I thumbnailed it, and it was like, oh, it'd be cool to zoom in close and then pull back and this and this and this, I gave the scene a lot of room and a lot of close-ups. So they needed to be saying something. And I had no idea what the hell they would be saying to each other. And I can't just do six pages of, oh, you almost got me. Oh, I'll get you next time. Um, <laughs> oof, pow. Yeah. Yeah. So Hellboy became the beast of the apocalypse because I needed her to say something. So she coughed up this prophecy. And the whole time I'm doing it, I'm like, well, I got nothing else. So that's where things, and you know, that's how that happened. So we all love your characters, but you each, um, what you share in common is that you have really comprehensive world building. Your worlds are very complete. Is that something that you think is very important to the success of connecting with fans? 
Um, well, in my case, I didn't have to world build. It was just there. It's the 18th century, you know, but, um, but you know. <laughs> which is copyright free, which is great. Which happened, copyright and it's free. public domain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess I should say that it's a very thorough yeah. world, yes, because you happened. do describe it very <laughs> thoroughly. Yeah, well, that, as I say, is why I decided to write historical fiction for my practice novel. I was just going to write this book to learn how to write a novel. I wasn't going to show it to anyone, let alone try to get it published, which is why it has no genre, because I didn't need one. I could just use anything I liked, so I did. But, you know, uh, but as I said, I was a research professor, and so, you know, finding out the details of what people did, slept, ate, and so forth in the 18th century was fine. But along the way, I began to uh, realize what one of my friends later called historical serendipity, which is if you immerse yourself in a period, or in an imaginary world for that matter, as long as your rules are, are present, uh, you begin to realize how people thought, you know, because you're reading their actual words. You're seeing what they did. And so you come to a certain thing where your characters are going to, you know, perform a task or somewhere. You don't know how this happened in the 18th century. You can't find it anywhere in the research. And so, you know, you're going to make it up. But the thing is, you know what those people are going to do because you know how they thought and what they had available to do it with. So you go ahead and write it, you know, to the best of your ability. And I will lay you uh, any money you like. Within a month, you'll find it somewhere in the research and it will be just like you wrote it because it, it's there. It's in the pattern. You just need to understand your world, whether it is, you know, external or internal purely. I mean, world building is a requirement of any fiction. You know, it, it, otherwise it wouldn't. Ex otherwise, the fiction wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be interesting enough to be a novel, right? <laughs> and there has to be something particular about the world in those circumstances. I do miss being able to write about people like going out for a latte and having ordinary business to do. It's much. It's it's very helpful for stagecraft. You know, because there's a lot of business. You have to do a lot of business. You you, you got a conversation, but they got to be doing something. And you know this. This bright, busy world in which we live provides endless amounts of easy material. I'm so envious of contemporary novels to write things set, you know, with, without any weirdness in them. But, um, but I learned a lot about this from actually a friend of mine, who um, a novelist named Elizabeth McCracken, who I went to graduate school with many years ago, and she um, her. Her second book was a very successful novel called The Giant's House. It was a literary novel published by Random House. And it's about a love affair between a uh, middle-aged librarian and a 10-foot tall boy. Okay? He is like, a, you know, there's a name for the condition or whatever, but he's one of those people that's so tall, it just freaks you out. Like, it's just like the world seems to bend around them. Enormously tall, right? And, and she's a rather diminutive woman and he's like 18 years old and, and people with that condition also don't live very long so he's, his sense of like time and he's a, he's a big distortion of time and space that comes into her very narrow confined life and but the thing is she's got a 10 foot tall character in her novel right you would it's hard to remember that everything is different not just because he's tall but because his arms are long and his shoes they are size 80,000 and whatever it is right and she was working at the fine arts work center in Provincetown on a sort of residency um, and so she had a studio that was kind of like this room it was sort of a white walled artist studio and she had her desk you know up against the wall and what she did to remember this fact about the book not only that he was enormously tall but everybody else was enormously short compared to him she basically had to world build him Right? Because the, his world was different from everybody else's by virtue of his dimensions. She put a, um, a lamp behind her in such a manner to cast her shadow on the wall at his size, sitting at her desk. Right? So she worked every day in, in with, saying, that's what it is. Because he's not just tall, he's large. Right? And in this room, that's, that's what the room is like for him, a much smaller room than it is to me. Right? Um, I love this story because it just sort of highlights the, the fact that, that world building is what we do all the time. Because every character is living in a world that is not the same as this one. It's a personal world. And so in a book like The Passage, where I have a futuristic community that's been isolated for 100 years, yeah, I will go the extra mile. And I did, like, I understand their sewage system. I really wanted to know how they would make that actually work so I could believe it. Right? I need to believe it so that then when I actually execute it, I don't need to tell people what happens when you flush the toilets, but because I believe it, that will show in everything that I do and in the way I'm always aware of the characters. It's my light bulb. It's my shadow on the wall, wow. knowing all those details. Yeah. That's great. 
Yes. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree, 100%. It's, uh, I mean, you know, like with my thing, I started with the real world, with some historical things, and if you're using Nazis, you just go, well, you don't need to explain a lot because they, Nazis. Did, so, they, did, so much, <laughs> they did so much crazy shit yeah. that eventually you find out the stuff you made up is mild compared to yeah. the shit they were really working on. Um, so I had a lot of historical basis uh, but I also embraced, you know, the supernatural stuff. But it, it basically was the real world. And then it's just over the course of the book, as I just started to destroy the world, you just had to keep track of, well, if we've made this state go away, how are things going to function? So there was not a conscious upfront, I've got to design my world. I mean, if you're a science fiction guy or a real fantasy guy, I guess you're making up your map with your kingdoms and, you know, what they call their money and how they measure distance, which sounds like a nightmare to me. Because uh, I also I can't make up names. I can't make up fantasy names. I've only made up two in 25 years, uh, which is why I use a lot of folklore and mythology, because somebody already made up all the names and they invented all these wonderful characters that are copyright free. So most of my stuff comes from books. It makes me look smart, and it's a shitload easier than making up <laughs> Gorgolong, the, you know, whatever. Because that stuff is, is uh, yeah. I, when, I, when people say, well, why, why did you call your book Hellboy? I said, because by the time I created Hellboy, I would have been embarrassed to call it Axelor Demon Slayer. You know, <laughs> if I'd written the book when I was 13, that Axelor might be what it was Demon called. Yeah. Uh, but by then, in my mid-30s, I was like, I need to let the audience know that I also know this is kind of a goofy thing to do. <laughs> So what's your advice to all the writers in the room today that would like to make a career of it or at least, you know, enjoy their writing for the rest of their life? Start. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, that's it. Just start. Yeah, because everybody, I mean, everybody says, oh, I really want to write a book. I've got this great idea. I just need a, a chunk of time when I can do this. I had a, um, I was a university professor for a long time as well in the sciences. I had a, a friend also on the faculty, and he would tell me this all the time. He really did have a terrific premise for his book, and he'd say, well, you know, I have to finish this series of seminars, and then I'm going to do this consultation job, but then I should have, you know, three months free. And I said, David, you're never going to write that book, and he never has. You know, because he didn't know how you do this. Nobody has time. You make it or you haven't got any. But the thing is, you don't need a whole lot of time. Everybody thinks you do, but you don't. I mean, a lot of people think, well, I have an idea, but I don't have an outline. I got to do this. I got to do this. You don't. You need yourself and something to write with, you know, a laptop, a pencil, whatever. Sit down. Write something for 10 minutes. You can do anything for 10 minutes. You can hold your breath for 10 minutes, probably, if you tried. But, you know, uh, <laughs> write for 10 minutes. You know, write anything. Just put words on, pa on paper. That oils your synapses. It gets you to think. And it stimulates your unconscious, which will go right on thinking when you stop writing. So do this for 10 minutes. Come back and do it again the next day. It'll probably take you a week, maybe two weeks weeks until you begin to miss it if you don't do it, you know, like exercise, yoga, or whatever. Um, and, you know, just keep doing it. If you do that, you know, 10 minutes a day for a year, you will have at least a rough uh, draft of a novel by the end of the year. You don't do it, you'll have nothing. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you need some time all the time, right? It, what matters is not that you wrote today, it's that you're going to write tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's like the first rule of writing is the same rule as any job. The one rule every job has, you got to show up. Right? It's the first thing you've got to show up. So just show up. Show up every day. Like find a way that that can happen and then guard it with your life. The world does not want you to write a book. Absolutely it doesn't. It wants you to do just about anything else, okay? Um, and so it doesn't, you know, you, you, you're, you're going to have to be um, sneaky, crafty, clever, and firm to do it. You're going to have to say, like, this is when it happens and nothing else is going to get in the way. And you know, my daughter is a writer. She's actually still in college. But she's very talented. She's a playwright. She's working on her first novel. And I said, look, your college friends are going to get in the way of this. Like, and, she, and, and she's very, she's very, very devoted and, and very smart about this. And she, you know, she leaves. She goes to a particular place every day, early in the morning. She's got a routine. And the routine is inviolable. Like, it has to be something that is, like, it's a boundary other people are just simply not permitted to cross unless at great social expense. The rule of my office, which is in the house, um, it's on third floor, a little flight of stairs, you know, up there. Is, you may bother me if it involves one of two things, blood or fire. <laughs> blood or fire, that's it. Not did you call the bank. 
okay? Like, not, oh, I forgot to, no. But he, no. Blood, fire. Yeah. The only thing I'll add to that is, 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 is just a, a sort of curly cue in what Diana said is, you do have to start, but you also have to finish. That's the most important thing. Treat your project, whatever it is, like it, it doesn't exist until you actually get to the last sentence the first time through. Until you have a manuscript, you have, treat yourself like you have nothing. Don't give you, yourself permission to just noodle around in the weeds forever. Most projects, most books people sit down and try to write, I think you can, I think you can fake it till about page 120, okay? I think you can. And then just like you're tired, just spin in on ice for a while. Like, you no, know, write page 121. Keep going, get it done. Even if it's bad. Bad is great. Bad is great because bad is done, right? And then you have something. Yeah. And you'll get better. I mean, yeah. that, was, that was the piece of advice, the best piece of advice I got when I started the Hellboy thing. A very, you know, famous comics guy said to me, um, you just do it. And no matter what you do, you're going to look back in 10 years and you're going to be embarrassed by it. But, the, but then you just, you have to keep moving because you can redraw those pages 500 times, but you are where you are and you're only going to get better the more you do. Uh, and, the, and the advice, I mean, I get a lot of comics guys who are working for Marvel or DC Comics and they're like, oh, I want to do what you do. Um, and I said, well, here's my, you know, maybe it's a little bit, you know, you know, rose-tinted glasses kind of advice. But I said, at least if you're going to try your own thing, do something you really love. Make it, if you love Westerns, do a Western. Um, rather than, and again, this is very much a comics thing. It's like, oh, what looks like it's going to sell is this. Or what looks like might sell as a movie or a TV show is this. And so much of what I see the comics guys doing these days, the guys who own their own material, it's clear that they're pitching a movie or clear that they're pitching a TV show. And if you're trying to cash in on something that's a hot trend, by the time you're done, yeah. that hot trend is ancient history. Yeah. So try it. I said, it doesn't have to be Dune. You know, do a, everybody's got a website. Do a five-page story of exactly what you want to do. Put it out there, and who knows? You know, uh, Tom Hanks sees it and says, that's my next project. You're never going to know if your dream job uh, is, is going to catch on. I mean, you know, there's no way in hell that, I, you know, people come up to me and say, how did you go about creating your transmedia franchise? I said, it's called Hellboy. I clearly didn't think anybody was ever going to use it for anything. <laughs> but I did it for myself, and it worked well enough that I'm stuck doing a book that's entirely made of all the shit I wanted to do. <laughs> so try it. It might not work. For, it won't work for a lot of people, but you'll never know if you don't try it. We have 30 seconds. Read the book before or after watching. <laughs> Read the book, um, I'd say after, uh, at least for mine, because uh, the, the show is as faithful as it can be to the books, but you know, they're cramming a book that takes 37 hours to read aloud into 12 hours of acting. So you know, you're gonna miss a lot, but they do tell a good story. They tell enough of it in the, uh, in the atmosphere of the book that people want to go and find out more. So yeah, after. Oh, I, I didn't even, I've never even thought of it that way, but before, me first, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> before and then again after. I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, I, I've had more people tell me I saw the movie, then I read the book, and I liked the book much better. I've only had one person I can recall say, uh, I saw the book, and then I read, or I, I, read, I saw the film, and then I, you know, read the comic and I like the movie much better. It may be that just most people aren't rude enough to tell, right. <laughs> tell you that, um, but I think, you know, uh, they're separate things, you know, do both. Well, thank you all so much. Outlander season four is on Stars November 4th, um, and please let her rush out. She's gonna be at a signing though, so you can hop over to booth 1A immediately after. Um, the Passage season one is gonna be out on Fox next year, and Hellboy April 12th of next year, the, the new Neil Marshall. So thank you all for being here today, and thanks to Diana, Justin, and Mike.